Right. Well, welcome. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start, and thank you all for coming to this session. Um, my task uh, was given, that was given to me, was to give some thought to the domestic church and witness, given the context of um, the celebration of this, you know, both Gavi Metzvez and other documents of Vatican II and our shared baptismal uh, call. So I have done that and I'm hoping that uh, this gives us some food for conversation, some food for thought. I have been listening with great interest to a lot of the other uh, presentations, enjoying them. It has caused me a little bit to maybe rethink some of the, the things that I've done. But um, if you didn't get my bio, which is apparently left off of the, um, uh, the program, uh, I do teach at Creighton University, do a number of masters of ministry kind of programs, Christian spirituality. My area is particular history of Christian spirituality. Um, but I also have written out of my own experience and out of uh, some study about family spirituality as well. I just celebrated with my husband 38 years of marriage, and we have three grown children and three and three quarters grandchildren. So, <laughs> yes, so the three quarters one will be due in August, which is very exciting. And um, so I've had the opportunity not only to try to live something of the domestic church, but also to teach courses as well in various ministry programs and such on family spirituality, uh, on friendship, on spiritual paths that um, have been more articulated and um, we think more about something like family life as a spiritual path than we did perhaps before Vatican II in the Catholic Church. So I'm going to have a three-part presentation. I apologize if I didn't do um, little PowerPoint things, but uh, this is the way this worked out. Three points. Um, the first is uh, considering our baptismal witness in the domestic church. In terms of the universal call to holiness, I'll say more about that. And the second piece will be about uh, mission to the wider world in the domestic church. And the third part will be some reflections on preaching, calling on a figure, um, a lot of what we've heard in the last several several days and several presentations has really drawn on the collective theological and um, uh, you know sort of pastoral imagination of the church since the Vatican Council and I'm going to go back to the 17th century because I have a, a favorite friend back there and to say something about preaching um, as well so to begin at the risk of being perceived as irreverent I really do need to begin this discussion of the witness of the domestic church by reminding us that a mere 50 years ago, during the era in which the Second Vatican Council was convened, the primary witness to the world of a family's Catholicity tended to be the number of children they produced. A family might also be recognized as Catholic, but the fact that they engaged in devotional practices avoided the churches of their Protestant neighbors, or did not divorce. Since the Council, much has changed, including the context of family life, especially um, globally and in this, in this country, and the church's thinking about Christian witness and the baptismal call. Vatican II, of course, did not happen in a vacuum, and its pronouncements that would influence the Catholic domestic church and expand its sense of witness had been coalescing for some time. But the magisterial enunciation of two themes on which I wish to focus here, the universal call to holiness in Lumen Gentium and the mandate to turn to mission in the wider world expressed especially in Gaudium et Spes and at Gentes, have gradually shifted the ground upon which Catholic family life is planted, and thus the way Catholic families might think of themselves and eventually witness to the wider human community. 
these two highly conciliar themes, the universal call to holiness and mission to the wider world, seem to me have profound consequences for contemporary family. They certainly clearly situate the smallest unit of church where it actually has always been, but perhaps has not always seen itself as having a vocation that is simultaneously individual and personal, and at the same time, social and political. I have a little disclaimer here that I'm aware of the significance of the context from which I am speaking. I can only speak from the context in which I find myself. Um, and so the following remarks, although I hope they are helpful and maybe applicable to the majority of Catholic families, nevertheless really do emerge from my own North American uh, context and all that that entails. But, to start with the universal call to holiness. Lumen Gentium clearly gives voice to the idea that all the baptized are called to lead holy lives. Chapter 5 begins with the statement that the church derives its holiness from God, who in infinite love united himself to her as his mystical body. Therefore, quote, in the church, everyone, whether belonging to the hierarchy or being cared for by it, is called to holiness. It's a quote from Lumen Gentium. The increased participation of laity in all aspects of Catholic life in the years since the Council, as well as the rise in lay ministry and uh, lay people seeking spiritual direction and getting involved in retreat work and doing a variety of things, indicates that this universal call, which is rooted in baptism, has been grasped by many of the faithful. However, it's not clear the extent to which the idea of holiness has seeped down to the level of the domestic church. My observation during 25 or more years of teaching and ministry has been that it is a challenge for many families simply to reimagine their domestic lives as a genuine spiritual path, a path whose point of immersion is distinctive from the path of priesthood or religious life, but is nevertheless a profoundly incarnational path with its own particular dynamics, challenges, and joys. The tendency, a carryover from centuries of assumptions about Christian perfection, has not only been to assume that family life is somehow uh, less holy or you know, not as sacred a way to follow Christ, but that holiness is about imitating or replicating specific models help up for veneration as holy. Classic models of holiness, the saints, have been for the most part, and this is not a new thought on my part, celibates, persons who have left the world, or those who have eschewed domestic life for another kind of call. And it, however, it's true that models and ideals have a powerful function as we grow in faith being inspired by a Mother Teresa of Calcutta or a Teresa of Avila, following in the footsteps of Oscar Romero, modeling one's life from the work of a Catherine Macaulay can be profoundly formative and fruitful. But I think two issues arise here for families. Again, these are rather obvious ones, but they're, they're important. First, the church needs more saintly models that affirm the beauty and dignity of domestic vocations. There are really few days of liturgical observance reserved for persons whose family life has identified them as candidates for sainthood. There are some people who have been married and children and such, but it's not because of that that they've been uh, held up for veneration. Obviously, this is a topic too large to address here, but it is one, I think, that needs some attention. We can talk about that later. Second, as essential as the witness of the saints is, even if we were to canonize those whose witness is primarily in the intimate world of the domestic church, the spirit-led adventure of holiness is not something that can be easily copied, I would affirm, not to mention given specific parameters. I really don't believe that there is any true holiness that is generic. Instead, to paraphrase Francis de Sales, a favorite saint of mine, we are asked to be who we are and be that well. 
Our baptismal challenge is to venture into the mystery of the life prompted by the Spirit of God and aware of the particular gifts and liabilities we possess and in the specific context in which we find ourselves to say yes to the often unexpected and untried siren call of that spirit. This was true for the saints that the church holds up for veneration, and it is still true today. I've always liked theologian Karl Rahner's way of putting it. To paraphrase him, the saints are the pioneers in each era, bringing into being new yet unrevealed aspects of Christ's own inexhaustible holiness. So, if you accept my statement that there really is no generic holiness, this is true for families as well as individuals. No two families are the same, and no one predetermined set of practices, decisions, or arrangement <coughs> makes a family holy. Instead, it is in the lived struggle, the creative and singular engagement with particularity while being grounded in a universal faith has a rich treasure of resources upon which to draw, that holiness is forged. If out of this struggle, faith, hope, and love flower, holiness can be identified. I mention this because it seems to me that on the one hand, the church since the Second Vatican Council has really attempted to address families as baptized Christians who are genuinely called to witness in the world. And there are many programs available to aid families in crisis, to inform families of their responsibilities of members as members of the domestic church. There tend to be diocesan offices for marriage and family life, and long-term marriages are often held up for public celebration. Lay Catholics are encouraged to participate in those aspects of parish life. On the other hand, I don't want to sound too negative or gloomy, but my observation has been that the address to families or the teaching about family often seem to be so general and theoretically or so restricted to marriage preparation or to sexual ethics that they may fail to inspire the longing for holiness in all aspects of life to which all Catholics are, and Christians are called. Spiritual formation of the laity needs to go beyond instruction in doctrine or catechesis. Here's an example. I taught this document. It's not the newest document there is, but I think it captures the spirit of what I what seems to be a, a sort of pervade um, pastoral responses to the domestic family. The spirit of the council is clearly evident in the Familiaris Consortio on the family. Pope John Paul's or Saint John Paul's. Uh, the second apostolic exhortation inspired by the 1980 Synod on the Family and promulgated in 1981. The document begins by situating the domestic church in its present social and cultural situation. It then identifies the role that the family plays in the larger ecclesial body. So it places the family in a particular role in the larger mystical body of Christ. The fundamental nature of family in that document is identified as a communion of love, particularly dedicated to the transmission and nurturing of life. The exhortation affirms the innate dignity of all members of the family, being specific to describe the family of, as consisting of two parents and their offspring, while mentioning the importance of elders. It considers the family's prime ministry to be the spiritual nurture and education of children in the faith and in the fundamental values that allow human community to flourish. The exhortation likewise considers families as evangelizing communities rooted in the sacramental life of the church and offering service to the larger society. This is clearly, for its moment, and maybe for all time, I don't know, an expansive vision and an important official a placement of family life in its position as one of the many sanctified paths to which baptism might lead. In general, I think this is really a vision that still undergirds most church teaching and Catholic pastoral practice today. However, out of my teaching experience and my lived experience and reading a bunch of things and listening to a lot of people, Familius Consortio closes with a discussion of the pastoral care of families 
again situating the domestic church primarily within the larger vision of the body of Christ and seeing it as fulfilling its assigned role and doing so by embodying the communion of love through a particularly defined structure and practice. A final segment considers the pastoral care of difficult or irregular cases, families that one way or another fail to mirror or replicate the domestic church described in the foregoing discussion. <clears throat> Among these are mixed marriages, trial marriage, civil marriage, free unions, divorce, and remarriage. I don't intend, open the Pandora's box of this, do not intend to discuss or raise objections to the moral, theological, or doctrinal issues that are pertinent here. But I have to raise this question. Does a family witness to holiness primarily because it replicates a particular structure? Is a family holy because it consists of two parents and their children who fulfill all the criteria outlined in all the family, on the family? Are they holy because they show up together each Sunday at Mass? I would hope that a consistent immersion in the deep wisdom of the church's sacramental life would worm itself into the hearts of parents and children. That is the intent of coming, is, not, is it not? But for attendance to move beyond obligation, some really fiery quickening of spirit needs to occur. Put simply, is holiness synonymous with behaving or appearing to behave in a particular way? Does a family's irregularity or difference inhibit the longing for or the realization of the holy? Or is the attempt to foster and realize a communion of love in all sorts of circumstances actually what holiness in family is ultimately about? So I would prefer to shift the focus a bit when thinking about the universal call to holiness in the domestic <coughs> church by giving more attention to the spiritual capability of a variety of families actually found and to the arts of discernment. Holiness, I would contend, is as much about radical openness to the Spirit of God as it is about fulfilling obligations or expectations for the performance of duty. Please do not get me wrong here. I am not advocating that obligation should be shirked or that faithful practice is not essential in spiritual formation. I'm simply saying that when we speak of family and holiness, I think what is key is to nurture the arts of individual and communal discernment that can enable radical availability to God's inrushing spirit. This is a task not exclusive to the model Catholic family but to all families. Such discernment involves individual and communal immersion in scripture and tradition, attentiveness to wise mentors and to the prick of conscience, as well as to actual experience and to the prompting of the deepest of human desires. This is followed by the attempt to sift through all that is peripheral and then to listen again, both individually and communally, sifting and sorting the various impulses, demands, circumstances, so that the plumb line that hones toward the ground of love can be felt. Whatever discernments we make in family, however we do that, it, it's, it's, it's really a, the, the, this process of discernment is not something that should be, I think, just reserved to those people who you know, read the, or do the exercises of St. Ignatius, um, as much as a more communal experience, or communal teaching and learning of how to, how to begin to sift, how to trust that, number one, we are beloved children of God, and that God speaks to us and acts and prompts us through the Spirit. Parents need to learn and model these arts in order to be true teachers to their children. So while I fully appreciate Familiaris Consortio's description of the domestic church as a communion of love, I'm a bit less convinced that the generalized vision it presents and that is hung on the framework of what the regular or not difficult family should be like really unlocks the full promise of the universal call to holiness. God's spirit cannot pry us open, remake and transform us 
when we assume that it is only when we have no problems or only when we look like the idealized family or person that God can and will meet us. I have a favorite phrase that God can't meet us where we think we ought to be. God can only meet us where we are. And that's where discernment starts, is precisely where we are. In the context of the contemporary world, we have lots of, lots of variety of people, situations, contexts in which we, you know, God can meet us. Grace tends to find us not necessarily in our sufficiency, as fine and as powerful as that might be, as in the humility of our insufficiency, our brokenness, and our particular irrepeatable unique situations. Perhaps what I'm trying to say is that forgiveness, mutual compassion, and a shared effort to meet each other halfway are some of the classic spiritual practices that may allow families to aspire to the unique holiness to which each of them is called. The fruits of such earnest discernment cannot but be a witness to the wider world. It may be that to really encourage the arts of discernment among Catholic families is a daunting pastoral uh, ideal. But small faith sharing groups, renewal movements, days of reflection, parish missions, and programs in spiritual formation are some of the ways that that might happen. Already, plenty of individual Catholics seek out associate programs offered by religious orders or attend prayer groups or seek, seek spiritual direction. Further attention to genuine family formation beyond marriage preparation would really be welcome. I think this involves um, a deep sense that the wider community of faith is in fact, you know, has that baptismal call and given some encouragement, given um, a, a sense of their own lives as a vocation, as a spiritual path, um, can open up new doors for people. So that's number one. I could say a thousand other things that write three books about this, but second point, mission to the wider world. The Vatican Council's final documents, Gaudium et Spes and Agentes, as well as the ongoing tradition of Catholic social teaching, which seems to be wending its way into the consciousness of Catholic laity in the last decades, prompts the domestic church to expand its sense of witness beyond the intimate confines of home and personal relationships. And for a long time, we, we think of the domestic church, we think of the, you know, it's the family as in and of itself, and you know, again, something like Familiaris Consortio gives us this vision of a communion of love, but with very particular um, structures that, that it holds forth as ideal. Um, but we're prompted now to move beyond the intimate confines of home and personal relationships. Members of families are not only parents, children, and in-laws, but workers, citizens, consumers, and societal agents. Pope Francis has particularly encouraged the faithful to embrace a perspective that shifts attention away from preoccupation with internal ecclesial issues toward the poignant and pressing issues that trouble the wider human community. Poverty, injustice, violence, the in unequal distribution of resources, He's drawn attention to the marginalized across the globe and brought into focus the teaching on the option for the poor that has its germ in the Latin American Episcopal conferences that followed and have continued to follow in the wake of the conference uh, of the council. Both John Paul II and Benedict the XVI, before the present pontiff, also oriented Catholics toward the contemporary world. For example, in his 1990 World Day of Peace address, John Paul spoke of one of his favorite themes, respect for life, and he decried the lack of respect for life not only in the realm of individual morality, but as evidenced in patterns of environmental pollution and global economic policies that result in the concentration of goods among the few and the creation of conditions of misery for much of the human community. In light of this wider lens, Families are invited anew to consider their lives, this time, in the clear light of this broader global human family. 
The discernments called for here are myriad and require both individual and collective attention. Virtually every aspect of family life, especially in the global north, I'd have to say, might well be examined with an eye thus widened. First, and this is kind of the first wave obvious response, and it's what many Catholic families already do in their roles as educators, parents teach their offspring to practice charity, to, to share, to be mindful of good things. Perhaps they already donate toys to tots at Christmas time, or visit a nursing home to spend time with the elderly, or volunteer to work at the Special Olympics game. Maybe they distribute turkeys at Thanksgiving. These are all very worthy charitable enterprises, and they're appropriate for helping children move beyond their own concerns. But the more fundamental call in this regard than charity is justice. In today's global community, indeed in parts of most American cities, poverty, violence, and hunger are rampant. Human migrations caused by unjust policies, war, and economic necessity spill out across the world's borders and environmental degradation encroaches upon us all. This is what opening to the contemporary world means, to weigh the vision of a world inspirited divine by divine love over against the stark statistics of a very different global reality. And I'm not given the, one of the comments that happened in the first session this morning in the uh, plenary session about uh, the woman who suggested that you know, she was always preached about the world and it's a terrible place and making this huge dichotomy. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying, you know, the temptation of the world, this evil place, we have to kind of escape to our, um, our little bubble. But I'm saying that the world in which we live, all of us, particularly in the global north, is not, uh, is not a world of uh, leave it to beaver, it's not a world of sex in the city, I mean, maybe partly, but for very few people, for the most people in the world, and this is our world, this is the world we're giving our children, there is this huge, huge cry of the poor and cry of those who are marginalized or dispossessed who clean the, clean the hotels um, in our fancy places that we stay, who um, are trafficked across the United States, and it's, 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 it's really a different world than it was 30 years ago. Parents may need first to inform themselves about this world, and then as educators, they need to help their children as they grow older to learn the reality of the world in which they're growing up, not by terrorizing them or shaming them. But at this point in history, such a perspective is not simply sentiment, for those less fortunate, but is really a clear-eyed assessment of an unstable world that is our questionable legacy to our children and grandchildren. The Catholic Church, the domestic church, is not only a church of the hearth, a community of nurture and care. The Catholic family must be that, yes. But it must also be a witness to a truly Catholic vision of the dignity of the human person Catholic social teaching defines as both sacred and social. Because I have lived it, I am sympathetic to the complex challenges and discernment with which this two-pronged mandate to love confronts families. What does it mean to take care of the persons one has been entrusted to? What does it mean to nurture, feed, house, shelter, educate, and prepare your children for the future? What does it mean to care for your elderly and infirm, to meet the demands of the work that sustains family life, and yet also attend to the cries of the world beyond charitable giving? What does it mean concretely for the domestic church to make an option for the poor? Again, I don't think this is an easy, one easy answer, nor one approach can work for every family or for any given family all the time. I'm very aware that in the North American economic and societal context in which this must be negotiated, fueled as it is by an unforgiving ethos of individualism and a fierce competitiveness of a market-driven economy. But the challenge, I think, is really real, and the witness is real as well. 
One contemporary theologian who has addressed this thoughtfully is Julia Hanlon Rubio, whose family ethics, practices for Christians, takes its cue from Catholic social teaching. After surveying the sources of Catholic tradition and historical precedents from Catholic families as agents of social change, uh, Hanlon Rubio suggests common sense practices that have broad implications that include fidelity, eating justly, tithing, downward lifestyle nobility, and prayer as resistance. In the interest of time, I will limit myself to a consideration um, of tithing, basically. I recently taught Hanlon Rubio's book in a graduate course on family to Catholic ministerial students. They were a wonderful group. And I was not surprised that the adult participants were receptive to the notion of the family as a communion of love and the idea that marriage and family life could be a genuine spiritual path. Although this was, in fact, a new idea for some of them. They had just never quite named it that way or lived into it or experienced it that way. What did surprise me was the extent to which these very good students, most of whom were preparing to do lay ministry, had difficulty imagining what it might mean to tithe, if not literally 10%, but even to give regularly and allocate some portion of family resources or incomes to a wider world in need. They were comfortable with parish collections, they were very familiar with that, and when most of them thought of service to others, they assumed that their parish was attending to the needs of the poor. They were conversant with the occasional missionary appeal, with the Vincent de Paul poor box or the Christmas food drive. But none of them had been to a parish that had a twinning program with a parish in the developing world. Few had ventured out beyond the confines of a middle class lifestyle. If they had traveled, it was mainly to places of relaxation and pleasure. Few of them could imagine why a college aged daughter or son would want to spend a postgraduate year in the inner city as a volunteer with the Jesuits, the Capuchins, or the Salesians, insisting, in concert with the parents of many such young people, that advancement toward a corporate job or a medical or law career was what really mattered for that child's future. Tithing of time and talent like this seemed to many of these my ministerial students to be a frivolous diversion from what was expected as a postgraduate itinerary toward real life. Now I can appreciate, you know, you don't want your child living in your basement when they're 45 years old, but at the same time, <laughs> there was the, 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 but some of them are, um, but just the, the, the pressure of economic necessity in this country and expectation, especially given the, the fact that our children's generation is the first generation that's not going to do better than, you know, we were going to, my generation is going to do better than my parents. It's not that way anymore. It's, it's you know, jobs are scarce. They're, they're, who knows? The real surprise to me with this group of students was the difficulty these exemplary Catholics had imagining, had imagining how their individual families or the families to whom they minister might, in fact, witness to the social and political dimension of life and that as the smallest unit of church, participate in the enterprise of social transformation. But in fact, the options are endless. I'm really aware that for many families, simply making ends meet is a struggle, and that in various phases of any family's life, resources, time, and availability are severely limited. A new baby, young children, job loss, death, elder care, family illness, all of these have to take priority at different times. But any family can pick its choice of witnesses, and not all witness, and not all witnesses require extravagant commitment of time or resources. What it takes is the courage to imagine the Catholic family as a little bit <coughs> countercultural, not only because of its sexual ethics. Families are consumers and workers and citizens, and what they buy and what they do not buy, what work they do how they vote, what initiatives they support or do not support, how they relate to neighbors and those who are different from them, how and where they spend time, how they treat the land, the environment, all this is reflective of their faith. 
Here's a possible list of questions a Catholic family might ask itself. It's far from exhaustive. If we are not completely restrained in our work lives, does the work that we do and the way we do it accord with our faith values? What kind of housing do we need, not just want? What kind of transportation do we have and how many vehicles can we justify? What about energy consumption? Electricity, gas, fossil fuels? How much and what kind of clothing and possessions do we need or merely want? What about technology, home entertainment? How do our eating practices contribute to the global good and the environment? How do we witness against racial and gender and class stereotypes? How do we view domestic violence or human trafficking? How do we spend our leisure time? Do we monitor TV, cell phone use, and internet use? Do we recycle? How do we teach compassion and other-centeredness to our children? What does the option for the poor and the marginalized look like for us? How does what we buy or consume or support affect other people beyond our immediate circle? These might seem to many families like questions that are only marginally connected to faith. In fact, they are central questions entailing discernments that each family is encouraged by our tradition to engage. Certainly not all families can address all issues at all times. You have to choose your battles. You know, you have to, you have to choose something that you can give yourself to that's realistic, but that creates both a mindfulness and an actual action on behalf of something larger than your own family. But each can determine where their time and treasure might best be spent. And they might be encouraged from the pulpit to take their role as social agents seriously. So finally, my final remarks about preaching and families. I'll close with some suggestive reflections on preaching and the witness of the domestic church. And I'm going to draw here on what might seem to be an unusual source. I think we've mostly talked 20th century and, and beyond in this conference. But my source seems an apt one in the conflicted cultural and ecclesial situation in which we find ourselves today. As I suggested, I am a longtime student of St. Francis de Sales, the 17th century <coughs> French-speaking Savoyard bishop and spiritual writer, who was deemed by later generations both a saint and a doctor of the church. He's remembered for many things. His gentleness and humility, which was modeled on Matthew 11, 28-30, and for his incredibly persuasive preaching, some of the great preachers of the tradition. He also promoted what today we call the universal call of holiness. In fact, his teaching was explicitly the source of the universal call to holiness in the Second Vatican Council. What is less known is that de Sales's pastoral style was forged very consciously in the context of great conflict and violence. He was Bishop of Geneva in exile from his diocese because Geneva was a Calvinist stronghold from which the Catholic faith was banned. Even more striking was the strife within his own Roman Catholic fold. France and its neighbors, a little history lesson here, quick, quick. Um, France and its neighbors, including Savoy, were religiously divided at this point. It wasn't just that, oh, there were some Calvinists and some Lutherans over there, but the, the Countries themselves were literally divided, and they were all together. The militant, and I mean both militant militarily and ideologically, we're talking armed um, militants, the militant Catholic League, which was a zealous wing of the Roman Church, which was opposed not only to the Protestant minority and the accession to the throne of Protestant race Henry of Navarre, who in fact had converted to become king, the violence of this Catholic League extended to members of its own church who would take a more moderate stance toward the Protestant minority and toward Henry's claim. As an adolescent, Francis attended school in the Latin Quarter of Paris, which was a hotbed of militant Catholic zeal. A critical spiritual crisis, he became terrorized that he was going to be alienated eternally from God, was precipitated when he learned of Calvinist teaching of double predestination, but even more so 
by the threats of heresy and damnation that were hurled upon him and others by his militant co-religionists, by any, uh, upon anyone who did not perceive God or the practice of the faith as they did. So the Catholic Church was at its own, it was had its own, you know, not just conflicts or differences of opinion. I mean, literally, we were talking, um, you know, hurling, uh, you know, you're going to be damned, you're a heretic, um, and, and violent uh, conflict. The story is more complex than we can can be recounted here. But Francis's revolution, resolution of this crisis had serious pastoral consequences. He had a vision of a God whose heart is revealed in the gentle, humble Jesus, and who enjoins all who hope to be disciples to love as they have been loved. And this had implications for the way that he preached. He preached, as people said, heart to heart proclaiming the beauty and generosity of a God who desired all to embrace the loving relationships to which they were called, relationships both divine and human. The astonishing thing from a man living in such an unyieldingly oppositional, confessional, and interreligious era was that he never preached fear or shame or retribution or punishment. He did not denounce his enemies. He sought to win friends. He did not preach what the faith was against, but what it was for. He drew hearts with his gentle patience and his belief that each person has deep within the innate desire to return to the source of life. He did not scold, but invite. He did not threaten, but he offered friendship. His gracious and unrelenting campaign to counter the militant rigidity of his own confreres as well as those who stood outside the Catholic fold, gained him some critics whose vision could not accommodate any mercy for those whose faith seemed any less exacting or strictly defined as their own. But it also gained him the love and respect of generations, and it drew innumerable men and women in his own time and since into the fullness of faith. It shaped them as committed followers of Christ, as lovers of the divine lover, who pursues us with persistent tenderness and care. I digressed here because all that I have suggested about family and witness in the present age can, I believe, best be approached with many of the same pastoral assumptions that the Savoyard Saint held. We are in an era of promise, but also of conflict and division, both within and without the church community. His positive tone, his belief that all persons have an innate goodness and a desire to return love to the source of love, his pastoral respect for differences of perspective, his refusal to demonize, to instill fear or incite division are all relevant to our own time. He offered to lay persons not just instruction, but ways of prayer, ways to discern within their own context. He offered them the practice of the virtues, especially love, and he trusted that grace would do its transforming work in them. Today, I think we can affirm with Francis de Sales that all baptized Christians are called to witness to their baptism through the holiness of their lives, and that holiness is manifested chiefly in the quality of their relationships, the love, mercy, forgiveness, reconciliation, encouragement, and so forth, that family members have with one another. In terms of present-day families realizing the community of love, of which Pope John Paul spoke perhaps, spoke, perhaps more attention might be paid to the internal dynamics of family spirituality, not forgetting that particular external forms and behaviors are also important, but it has been suggested, for example, that forgiveness is one of the chief virtues that must be cultivated in the domestic church. I would name several other spiritual arts. The practice and capacity to welcome and let go. The tending of an ear capable of deep, attentive listening and of a heart capable of stretching wide enough to embrace the unpredictable mystery of the others with whom one is called to grow over a lifetime. These are not negligible arts. They are challenging ones. 
Families need to be encouraged and commended when they grow and heal and fail and wound one another yet return to forgive and embrace one another in a love that is wide enough to embrace the whole of human experience. We might also affirm that holiness is a lived experience of the challenging, healing spirit moving among us in the many forms of family life that are discovered today. The new challenge for Catholic families is to straddle the twin dimensions of a call that is simultaneously individual and personal, and at the same time, social and political. Families are, with the rest of the church, invited to the margins, called to evaluate the ways in which they might uniquely respond to the call to mission in the wider world, to heed the signs of the times, and have both been issued. To encourage this requi call requires, if Francis de Sales has anything to teach us, an emphasis on transforming families' imaginations through persuasive love and gentleness, on being God's love, rather than focusing always on getting it right, or by instilling fear or threatening exclusion. In this way, in this gentle way, loving the way God loves, the domestic church might become a true, vibrant, local witness to the mystery of God's surprising, unpredictable, and creative desire to transform the world.